All right, hello everyone. We are continuing our working session about multi-computation. And specifically, we had been looking last week at lazy data structures. And uh, I think several people are joining us today who weren't here before. So we need to uh, talk about some of what we had already figured out here. So the basic issue, I guess, is we want something like a lazy list, which has the feature that it essentially has a generator that allows it to produce new elements of the list um, when they are needed by some other function. And somehow there is an ability to go from a lazy list, for example, to an ordinary list, presumably with normal. And that's a thing where the concept would be, just like with sparse array, to preserve things, just like with sparse array, we try and preserve sparseness as long as possible. With lazy lists, we try to preserve laziness as long as possible. But uh, the a lazy list is not the only kind of structure we could consider. We could also consider a lazy tree, a lazy graph. As soon as we're dealing with lazy trees and lazy graphs, we have a complicated issue of evaluation of, of um, uh, kind of which elements we get to next with a list. If it's a question of uh, what have we computed so far, where's the next element to compute? It's a one-dimensional thing. It's fairly straightforward to do that. With these other things, like even with a tree, it's not obvious what the um, essentially the evaluation front should look like. And I guess we talked about last time, and maybe Nick can remind us here, we talked about the uh, the use, this concept of multiness um, as a thing related to laziness. Multiness is there are many possible evaluation paths that could have been taken. And that's the thing that becomes more, uh, I mean, right now our evaluator you know, goes on one path and right now functions like nest list and so on produce one sequence of things. The, the concept of multiness is there are many possible evaluation paths. We see that with multiple pattern matches. We see that with multiple down values. We see that with evaluation order for, for sub-expressions and so on. And what we would like to be able to do is to have a lazy data structure that represents multiness, including infinite, uh, you know, infinite multiness. And then what we want to do is have a variety of observer functions which sample aspects of this multiness. And we, uh, this sort of forces us to, to break apart the current evaluation model in which we just say there's an input, there's an output. Nick, do you have more to add to this from what we talked about last time? Yeah, well, I see essentially the lazy data structure is always when you have a natural hold argument. We already have a laziness built in in the language. It's every symbol that has a hold all. Mm -hmm. And in the additional data structure basically only adds more formatting and so on. But the laziness is already built in. We just have to add more functionality to work with those kind of things. Well, I mean, we don't have the ability. Look, if I if I have something that describes the primes, all the primes, we do not have, you know, and then we say select the twin primes and give us, or, you know, find what's the length of the select of twin primes. We absolutely do not have the functionality to do that right now. I mean, what sure. we talked about last time, perhaps we can remind ourselves is, you know, do we need a lazy select, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? We think not. We think that we can just use ordinary select. Uh, at least that was my my understanding from what was being said. Is, is that right? Uh, Stephen, may I ask why this discussion didn't even refer to uh, my work on streaming where, where I basically solved most of these problems already? <laughs> That's why you're in this meeting, Leonid. Okay. The, 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 the problem is we have a convergence of a variety of different technologies and objectives and so on. And, you know, part of what we're trying to do is to figure out, you know, how do we make a consistent design that people can understand that allows us to go forward with this? Because the, the you know, the ultimate goal, among other things, is 
you know, part of the goal here is to deal with this idea of multiness, right? The idea that there isn't a single evaluation path. There are many evaluation paths. Some of those paths might be infinite. Some might get definite results. Some we want to sample across some, you know, some slice and find averages, things like this. But I mean, you know, so please, Leonid, be ready to show what you have that you think can, I mean, you know, because we never, unfortunately, we've never deployed your streaming stuff. So, yeah, you know, um, and so that, that, that and so what we're trying to do and, and, you know, the main challenge that we have with the streaming stuff before was, you know, knowing what the workflow was supposed to be, you know, is the workflow uh, kind of coming, um, you know, what we had discussed before is, for example, streaming from files, things like this, but mm -hmm. that's very different from what we're discussing here. Yeah, and uh, I guess uh, I listened to parts of the past uh, video to the past uh, live, live stream, the previous one. Okay. And uh, one thing I agree with Christopher about is that I don't think oh, we can unify them to a single, like let's say a single lazy list in terms of uh, implementation. But I think we can uh, formulate a single lazy list interface, which is uh, what I did and which is uh, very much what you also did last time, which was very much in line with what I was doing earlier. Okay, good. But I mean, you've also dealing with another thing, which is a stream that the source of the list could be reading more from a stream. Yes. Potentially but, a stream that doesn't exist yet. Yes, yes, that's right. But I think um, uh, a more, perhaps a more fundamental difference with my approach is that I think if you do streaming, you want to achieve one of three goals, or maybe more than one, maybe several of three goals, which is save memory, save runtime, and realize infinite structures. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what I was doing was more in the domain of save memory and realize infinite structures. It was not in the domain of save runtime directly in the sense that I was explicitly building things around chunking, targeting essentially large data. So my approach would be pretty ugly to use for a single computation where, you know, let's say you just have very expensive single function call, which depends on the previous one. And then you want laziness so that you don't compute too much. Uh, so in that case, uh, my approach would be uh, sort of not, it would be probably the worst kind of okay, case let's review. For me. Let's review what um, oh, we don't have Christopher here. Did nobody invite Christopher? I can ping him and have him join. Wait a minute. Do we not have the people who we had last time here? Oh, I'm Guys? here. Well, that's I don't... good, Nick. On the invite list, Christopher wasn't present, but I can get oh, him if you want him. Sake. Who was in this meeting last time, guys? I can take a look and ask Corey. I'm just filling in for Kristen today. By the way, Stephen, these lazy lists bring back memories of 28 years ago when I did exactly that in one of my books. And so the important thing is I would recommend to define a data type like lazy list and with a small interface. In this case, we could for, call it first and rest instead of car and kudo, and then overload all the functions that can reasonably accept such lazy lists in place of ordinary lists, like select, map, fold, list, and so on. This would also allow us to perhaps have more than one implementation, just like we have more implement one, than one implementation for lists, like uh, sparse arrays and stuff like that. So we could make that somewhat uh, transparent. Um, just a second. Oh, that's what I'm experimenting with. It's that in addition to usual hold symbols, you can have some semantically different ones, like the ones that have flat attribute. And all the implementations of map and lay and select would be a little bit different. And you can add more of them. Yes, but as soon as if you have an operation that essentially takes a list one 
element at a time and that produces a resulting list, then it can be made to work in this, in this framework. Now, in some cases like map, the output will have the same size as input in cases of select or cases, it will not have the same length. And there are also ones that produce a single result like free queue or member queue which are partial functions because you might run into infinities if none of the elements actually satisfy the predicate. So there's yeah. infinity is built in, but that shouldn't prevent us from, from providing those functions that we reasonably can. Yeah, because we're having all, everything symbolic, I think there's no reason to delay the evaluation as soon as, as, like, as much as possible, even if you have if you wanna, for example, to evaluate length of an infinite list, doesn't mean it just shouldn't work. You just have to be some generator just have and that generates expression of one plus length of infinite list that starts from two and so on, right? You just and you would be able to just unpeel from this uh, expression as much as you want. Well, I disagree with yeah. that for length um, because I think yes. length should be an eager operation. I mean, in this, if you are strict about lazy list, be having a first element and the rest, which is another lazy list. By the way, I'm missing the symbol nil to indicate we need some way to indicate empty lazy lists. Then length would always have to traverse the whole thing. Now, this is not generally true for mutable data structures such as iterators, which I've worked on recently where you can where you have the state of the iterator somewhere manifest and you may be able to compute the length without actually generating the whole structure. So this, but this is a different different oh. approach. But Roman, in fact, there is a middle ground as well because mm -hmm. uh, the fact that lazy list is immutable for the user doesn't mean that it can't have internal state for in terms of implementation. So there might be like, for instance, in my case, I've been using a certain caching mechanisms so that you don't have to recompute certain lengths when you already know it because lists are immutable. So I don't think this is necessarily a like, you know, the, 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 the immutability can coexist with some internal. Yes, state. I mean, you are, you are correct. I mean, if we allow other representations other than the Carl could or cons mm -hmm. representation, I mean, there's no reason we could, couldn't have Say the take the, the range infinity, the kind of uh, prime example. Well, actually not prime, but <laughs> most important example here. There's no reason we couldn't have that range infinity itself be a symbolic object that just satisfies all the all the access functions. So you can have certainly figure out the first element of the range from one to infinity. And if you take the rest of range from one infinity, you just generate range of two to infinity. So yeah. in this particular case, you could actually compute the length without uh, actually uh, running the whole thing to the end. Yeah, that's uh, in streaming, that's exactly how, how this works. But uh, I actually wanted to, to make a different comment still. I don't know if, uh, if everyone is, uh, yeah, anyway. I don't, I'm not sure I think, uh, I'm not sure I agree that using hold all attributes as a means to kind of merging them with laziness is a good idea because I think this will tie us to uh, top level evaluation model very, okay, very Okay, listen tight. guys, guys, we have a problem here. The wrong set of people were invited for this meeting. The people who were here last week were not invited this week. This is completely wrong. So, Last week, we had a whole bunch of discussion. Uh, now, Leonid, who didn't make it last week, is showing up here, and Roman, likewise. And now you're bringing in a whole bunch of other things. So we need to kind of pull these together. So can can somebody help me out by just describing, maybe defining, maybe I have to make a list. It's really a shame we don't have the people who were here last week here. Uh, do I have to make the list of basically what what each group is saying we should be doing. Because I'm pretty confused. 
Now, I don't want, I'm, I'm disappointed that we didn't manage to connect the discussion last week to the discussion this week. So, well, who, Stephen, I can tell you some things I remember from watching parts of that uh, uh, previous uh, live stream, but that will be probably much. No, that's really a bad way to do it. I mean, maybe we okay. should give up on this meeting because I think we, we just, this was goofed. Uh, I mean, I think, I think, um, I, this doesn't seem useful to me. And I don't even know where, where this was supposed to go. Okay, can, can so, Nick, can you help out here? Well, from the last meeting, the only person that contributed to, to it was Christopher that it's missing, right? But if you just, we can just summarize our ideas and just, I don't know. Can we summarize? Go ahead and summarize them. Like my, okay, my idea was that the whole argument is like a, an explicit uh, instruction what arguments are considered lazy. It's uh, analogous to, like, if you take a lazy language by default, like Haskell, it has an explicit modification of arguments where you, it, they should be considered strict instead. Right, and there is no other language that have this the default semantics, but we have already a natural thing to also have this explicit thing that we can call a lazy. And that's the whole argument. Should we and we should just uh, basically make an, an analogous thing when we. But that doesn't solve the problem. I mean, what problem? Okay, look, what we're trying to do the the eventual objective which we've been through many times, is we are trying to have this these things like multi-evaluate that generate a structure that is lazy and that we can query and sample in a variety of ways. We've talked yeah, about this many times, well, right? That's the final goal. That's the final Yes, goal. that's the final goal. So we, we need to work towards that goal. Yeah, and it, the intermediate thing is this, like, things that can work with lazy data structures because of the... Well, okay, but I, I'm not convinced that, I mean, you know, given that that's the goal, which I'm not sure Leonid even knows that goal, I'm not, you know, I don't, we, we need to make sure that we're actually talking about things that are going to, why does that, how do I get something which is a little bit more interesting? Do I need a definition to get something more interesting? We don't have Ian here, so we don't really know, do we? Um, that's a single way evaluation. How do I get something which involves a multi-way evaluation? You can use multi-evaluate function of mine, for example. Okay, give me an example. Well, trace graph, I, I, well, first of all, it's not in the repository because fine. Okay. So. Um, okay, let's let's review again what we're trying to do. We're trying to get some, we, we talked about this last time. We have various ways that this multiness arises, as we talked about last time, right? We are trying to get, where, where is my notes that talk about things like um, uh, replace path and so on, find replace path? Do we need to go back? Do we have those somewhere or do I need to find those again? Hello, anybody? Looks like Nick put something in Zoom chat. Oh, that's multi actually. But I don't know about where the notes are. You know, I guess our usual project manager is off sick today, so. But this is not, this is a mess, guys. This is a mess. Got to do better. Okay. I really don't want to go back to what we've discussed like four times before, right? So we, we've we've talked about how, I mean, this is a trace graph. This trace graph, and, and again, Ian was going to make some further progress on this, but we don't have Ian here, so we don't know what's going on. So 
you know, what we expect is this trace graph shows essentially space-like spatial recursion through an expression together with time-like edges associated with evaluation. We also expect that there will be branch-like edges that come from having multiple possible uh, uh, multiple possible evaluations that we could do. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So we imagine that underneath there is a granular thing that in multi-evaluate, that this is the thing that is being at least imagined internally, that we are generating the structure that represents this multi-way evaluation process. Then, as we've discussed many times, what we want to do is be able to take that lazy object that represents these multi-evaluation things. And by the way, I assume Roman and Leonid, you're following this, yes or no? The question yes, does that, does that relate to innermost, outermost, and discussions we had before about evaluation strategies? Yes, this would be this would correspond to all possible evaluation strategies. The full multi-way graph okay. includes all possible evaluation strategies. From that graph, you can then extract, for example, pure um, uh, you know, the, the, the pure um, kind of... Um, so you would see those cases where it doesn't matter and where they all lead to the same result. Right, where there's confluence, for example. Yes. We could also, there might be a branch that's infinite as well as ones that terminate. Um, but one one thing you would do is you could do is slice off. I just want the leftmost innermost evaluation strategy, or uh, but I also would like to be able to have something where I say I want to find out is there any strategy that gets me to the number seven, for example. Okay, and if so, I might like to see the proof that I can get to seven, i.e., the path that gets me to seven. That's the function find replace path that I've been trying to get us to implement, which I implemented a version of like six months ago or something. Um, I've been trying to get us to do a better job on that. Right? Does that does that make sense to people? Sure. And and one of the implementations, possible implementations of the find replace path would be just traversing a lazy generator. And the answer to your find the seven would be just a three part. So that's why lazy data structures are important. Yes. Because what I'm telling here is just a, a, some manifestations of multi generators. Oh, okay, wait, wait, wait. You said tree part, but it isn't actually a tree because that's what we learn from multi way graphs is that even though you may take different branches, there may be convergence. Ultimately, there may be total convergence, and then you would have a confluence system where there's just one answer independent of the evaluation path. And sometimes you may have only partially converged. But well, either way, it's not a pure tree. You mean it's a DAG? Yes. Well, if you don't merge anything, it's still a tree. And this is sure. a tree. Even if some of the nodes going to merge, it's still going to be a tree. So we can describe any result that you find with a tree part anyway, even in the DAC. Yes. It, we're not going to be new, unique for a DAC case. That's true. Right. So there will be multiple tree parts that would all lead you to the same place. But you could exhibit, you know, a proof would be a particular path. That's what you're saying. Yeah. The first and there one. might be multiple proofs. Sure. Right. So that, that's the thing we're trying to get out of this is we're trying to be able to get something where for and and the thing that I've again we've talked about multiple times is you know one thing is evaluation, which I'm not sure if it's necessarily the most important thing. The other thing is repeated application of rules, right, which is a more controlled form of evaluation where you don't have down down values and so on, where you're just being given, you know, find replace path where you're given a set of rules, an initial condition, a final condition. You're asked, can you get from the initial condition to the final condition? And, you know, well, you might be asked, can you get there? Another thing you might be asked is, what is the largest thing you can get to? 
you know, treeing this out, what's the largest thing you can get to? Or another version of it would be, you know, uh, let's say expression simplification. What's the smallest expression you can reach from that initial condition and so on? Am I making sense? Yeah. Well, it's not going to be necessarily smallest. You can't really prove in general that it's going to be smallest, but smallest so far in your search, for example. Well, yes, I, I know, but I mean, that that's also, yes, that's right. But, but that, def that uh, we, we're going through the same stuff again, right? Remember, we have, you know, you can go through this graph and you can be going down. And the question is, what is the evaluation order in which you evaluate the graph? What I think one realizes is, you know, there's an evaluation front. Let's say it's in a tree. You can do depth first search. That's kind of time like first evaluation. You can do breadth first search. That's essentially branch like first evaluation. And in one case, in the case of the depth first search, you're going down the time like edges. In the case of breadth first, you're going across the branch like edges. Am I making sense? You're going to sibling nodes, which is going to nodes which are connected by a branch branch like edge. Am I making sense? Yeah. You can think of it as just unpeeling the weighted data structure. That is not that is not linear, but at least a two-dimensional one. If you have a lazy list of lists and you want to unpeel it to find a particular point of, of the of your interest. That's the yes. same. Yes, yes, yes. But I mean, but but the whole point is there is an evaluation front. And when you say, did you get there yet? The yet depends on what the evaluation front is. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, basically, if you have some function that also dictates where to go. I know, I know. Right. But what I'm saying is you said, look, what we what, what we're trying that's what we have to define here, right? We've got to define, you know, when we look, look, I mean, we've got Whatever my notes were here, you know, we, we're defining, uh, you know, what evaluation front, well, what multi-evaluation front we follow. Okay, we, we're going to sweep through this multi-way graph. That's sweeping through the multi-way graph, which is actually uh, multi-way DAG, and we're asking, what do we visit? You know, what is the sequence in which we're visiting this? Right? That's one thing we need to define. We've already got that. Unfortunately, Ian isn't here, but we've already got that in tree traversal order. Right? People know about this, yes? No? Yeah, that's you, just a limited case, a limited number of cases. Exactly. Right. I know. But so the question is, what is the general case of this? It's some kind of a bunch of selection function, ordering functions that you can do during your search of your wages structure. Yes. Okay, fine. But so so one thing we've got to do, we, you know, you got that. So so then, I mean, let's say we've got this lazy structure, whatever it is. We've defined the lazy structure by having, uh, again, I, I don't know. I mean, this is such a mess. I You know, this is why I specifically asked that we actually go over what we had figured out last time, which we apparently couldn't manage to do. Um <sighs> Okay, we talked about before. Okay, we've we talked about the sources of multiness. One of them being pattern matching, another of them being, uh, you know, which element, sort of spatially, in an expression you evaluate next. Right. Mm hmm. Okay, so I want to see where we make progress with this, right? Because we're, we're trying to, you know, again, we've got this definite idea and we've got things like find replace path. We're trying to make sure we implement. Have we got that yet? Well, there have been a bunch of attempts to implement it. I know, but so I'm trying to understand what, what, what are we actually looking at here? Because yeah. this is, you know, having a lazy version of every function I don't think is on, is, is you know, it doesn't make sense. I, I, I does agree, it? I agree, I agree. It's so just, what uh, are we looking at here? Well, this is the old notes. If you read oh, no, the, so wait, wait, so where are the space. new notes? 
Well, for the, this particular way, that the structure load examples. The new one is just if you click on the, on the link. Okay. And there are some examples of unnested things. Okay. You can try it out because now it's even dynamic. So we can click on these boxes to unpeel the weighted data structure manually. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's take a look at this. So th is this what we should be talking about today? Now, this is my implementation. We also have Leonids. We also have Romans ideas. I personally wanted to hear about those too. Okay. Well, but, but fine. But we, let's do it in the context of what you've implemented so that we're not going around in circles here. And if Leonid has a demo he wants to give, he could do that. Okay, so I don't understand. All right, so then we have this notion. Okay, so that's a lazy thing. And so yeah. you're saying. And it's just, in this case, lazy is just a hold with some formatting, nothing special. You can click on it, you can un unpeel the lazy. Well, why is lazy range of open bracket, close bracket this? Why isn't that lazy range of infinity? It's the same thing. It makes, makes sense to have a default. If there is no infinity, it's just an infinite list. Okay. Is this going to work? Nope, it's not going to work. Well, because you should get the actual... Why isn't that in here somewhere? I guess it's not the default thing. So we have what, do to... I, what, what should I say? Well, yeah, Wolfram backtick lazy. Backtick again. Yeah, and now this should work. Oh, Christ. Because you have a global lazy wow. Well. So here, lazy wow essentially just to unpeel the lazy infinite list 20 times. Yeah, but, but okay, but that's exactly the thing that we don't know how to do for a DAG. For a list, it's straightforward to say unpeel 20 steps. Yeah, that's why right. the data structure, of course, doesn't know about it. It's the functions that we're going to define it, define on top of it that should implement all the strategies. Yeah, well, fine. I mean, so so this here is just going to say that's just going to be an infinite lazy nest list, right? Yeah. You can click on those boxes, by the way. That's cool. And when you have a lazy list of lists, that would kind of model already enough structure for a tree and a deck. Right, and I, I think if I have, if you find an example for, I have a lazy splits there. It's one example of a function that generates a list of lists. Wait, wait. Split? You mean split singular? No, it is mean. What? There's no, there's no ordinary function called splits. Well, then, yeah, that's a, that's a, kind of. Why, why isn't this called? I'm sorry. It's what? There's no function splits in the language. It just only has an out in, in here. But what does it do? It just, uh, well, you just give it a list and it generates all possible splits of this list of this. Uh, in, in Why is that subsets? You, what do you mean by all possible? No, it's not subsets. It's sublists because it's, can, can, it's ordered. So you just sequentially split a list in three sublists or two or four. So, so it's not a function we have. It's a function that is yeah. essentially a partitions function. If I say integer partitions, and then I feed that of, let's say, five or something, and now I feed that. Is that, is that what this is doing? It's it's that integer partitions 
three. It's that, uh, right? And then it's take list of that. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. That's. That, I think that's exactly what it is. But it's lazy, so it generates it one by I one. I understand. So this. Okay, fine. So it's something like that. No, it also includes the empty lists. If you just uh, evaluate normal in it, you'll see what it actually has. Outputs as a result. Okay, but so here, okay, be nice if we had a thing which just said, uh, you know, go to the end of this. Yeah, it's like a debugger. This is like a functional debugger in some sense. Is that a way to think about it? Maybe. But, but it's kind of helped me to debug the actual functions. Like, no, wait, no. it's actually no. not too old to, to write. So I have to do, make this first. Okay. But I, I think it's kind of interesting to... Um, uh, You know, I think actually this concept of a, you know, we've never really figured out how to do debugging well in a functional setting. And this is sort of an interesting idea for how to do it. Because then we can imagine, I mean, in the thing I was just doing, I could imagine a, you know, run to the end type thing or run to, you know, from one of these, it's like run to the end. Did you, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, ju just, just instead of having just a single click behavior, yeah, There's right. Some kind of menu, how much times you want to click. Right, Next. exactly. Right. Okay, but but you've got many different functions here, which is clearly not ultimately going to work. I mean, this, this is, you've got, you know, many lazy X, Y, Zs, but that, what, what should we be understanding from this, from all this stuff? The you've lazy, got... lazy versions of them is just for convenience. I already have sub values defined for some of the, types of lists. Okay, but what's the base object here? It's either a cons or cons list, which is just a thing with hold attributes. And cons, it's a hold and a plot attribute. And that's it. Okay. I believe Athena here also implemented this at the summer school this year. So what we've now got, I wonder how many different implementations. Maybe Roman wins the prize for the earliest. When was your book, Roman? Uh, that was in 1984. 84? Wait a minute. Yes, that was, yes. This is before. Oh, no, even... sorry. Uh, 94. 90, 94, yes. 94, yes. But, I, but uh, the article in the book is from an earlier article in the Mathematical Journal. So it's actually a little bit older. I don't even remember when. And, and was that based on your stuff that you did? At ETH on combinators and things was that how that what was that? No, I mean that that was merely a programming exercise in 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 Wolfram language about uh, hold attributes and how you could easily implement possibly infinite data structures and how to nicely tie them up. So there is there is the data type uh, lazy list or cons, and once you have that, you can overload all the standard functions. You don't need all these lazy star functions. And I'm sure this approach can also use that this idea. But internally, of course, you have all of these for, for the implementation. But okay, so, but your object, just, just so I understand, what is cons? What is the definition of cons? A cons is a, a normal expression with two elements. Okay. It hold rest. Okay. And the first element of cons is the first element of that infinite list. And the second element of the cons is the rest of that yeah, infinite list. So when you start evaluating, like in you know, Lisp, you end up getting some kind of you know, linked listy type thing, not one of our array type lists. Well, true? no, I mean it. It doesn't. It doesn't evaluate, right? I mean, it's it sits there until it's brought to the surface, and the, the, the two the two main functions to access infinite lists is first and rest, 
And so all you have to do is define first of cons AB to be A and the rest of cons AB to be B. And then the B will be brought to the surface and usually it's a function that generates another one of these cons objects like the integers from one, the next one would be the integers from two, but it's all in held form. So it only evaluates when it's actually looked at. Yeah, but okay. So Nick, how different is that description from what you have done? Well, it's close, but I, I claim that having hold all for the cons is much more appropriate sometimes because I want to like hold or make or be lazy basically as much as possible. So I can even, as an example, if I have like an infinite list and a lazy map over it with some uh, difficult functions, function, but I then drop it. I don't want to evaluate the first argument anyway. So, so there are yes. two types of laziness, Stephen. There is laziness in single evaluation and there is laziness in realizing next parts of the structure. I didn't understand that comment. Well, okay, let me explain. Uh, in the Roman's approach, uh, you basically, when you evaluate uh, the list one by one, you don't have a intermediate step to prevent evaluation of the next element. It will always be evaluated when you take the, you know, first and rest and I so see. on. Mm -hmm. But what uh, Nick is saying is that in his approach, you can also control the evaluation of every single element and prevent unwanted premature evaluation of those. Okay. But, but okay, as a practical matter, you know, if we are trying to get to the goal of having multi-evaluate, what, I'm still very confused about what we're going to get here. I mean, in, okay, let's say, Nick, help me out again. In, in terms of, I mean, other than, okay, th then we've also got the problem. If we have an infinite data structure, if we have one of these things, how do we solve the canonical forms problem for infinite data structures? When are two infinite data structures the same? Well, that's, well, we're not going to solve that. <laughs> no, what are we going to do in the system when you say, blah, 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 double equals, blah, blah, blah. Probably the same thing we do when we say X equals Y, we do nothing. But are we going to have any way to, you know, to resolve well, that? We can, we can always be smart about it, but there's some work done with some code equivalences, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have two lazy generators, we can always compare them with this functionality. Like when we actually compare two different code, but that produce the same results. And right. depending on how it sophisticated it is but i think in general this would be uh, the only general way of doing that unfortunately is to either evaluate both of them completely or if they're infinite then good luck no that's that's a, i mean yes of course in general it's undecidable whether they're the same but you know it's like saying uh, i mean Yes, that's true in general, but there may be many specific cases for which we can figure it out. But I mean, it's not clear that's the important thing. So another question would be, you know, uh, size in terms of transfinite numbers is another interesting possibility. Right? Does that make sense to people what I, what I mean? Right? Yes, well, no. We don't, we're not dealing with numbers, though. We're not, in general, no, if, we don't if, know. If 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 you say length of an infinite list, right, of a, of a list that's been generated one element after another, the answer is presumably omega. Yeah, if we are sure that it's infinite and not going to hold at some point. Well, but, but right, but I mean, in assume it is infinite, assume it's its range of infinity, then the answer is omega. If we make a two-dimensional version of that, it's omega squared, isn't it? If we say flatten of the two-dimensional version, it's presumably omega squared. Sure, we can do some analysis to determine that. If you know the semantics of our lazy functions. 
Like right. the lazy range is always infinite. Right. I mean, so that's another type of thing we can we can figure out. Right. So that then, you know, we've got this lazy construct and it's, you know, we are doing transformations on it, where in the end, what it, I, what I'm confused by here is that we have a thing which is partially a lazy object. Because, you know, to me, if I take that result, okay, you know, one of the pathological things that's going to happen is if I take that result, okay, great. Now let me say length of that result. Maybe lazy length. Now that also works. Yeah. So in this case, it tries to be as lazy as possible. So it's not it's not going to evaluate all, all the way. Okay, but that's a little weird what it did. It's it's less pathological than I thought it was going to be, but it's still a little weird. In other words, yeah. why are you bit putting it a partially lazy thing? It seems like it's asking for trouble. Like with sparse array, right? If I say sparse array of, um, you know, range of 10 or something, I will purely get a sparse array. See what I'm saying? Let's say I yeah. say there's no partial normal of, of the sparse and, array. And actually, Stephen, for the same reason, I uh, tend to stay away from nested lazy lists in my approach because it's becoming pretty hard to control nested laziness in that you have to understand which parts stay lazy and which parts have been computed. So but, but, it, but I guess my question to Nick is, why do you want something where it is partially computed like this? I mean, I, there's this very interesting debugging idea. But well, it's also partially computed only when you actually show it on screen. It's like when the first argument of const list is on some unrelated thing, it's still going to stay unrelated. Okay, so if I say head of percent 10 here, I see. It's that. Okay, so the, this is just for display. Yeah. Is there a cons tree or what? What? How do you make the tree? Well, no, I haven't paid attention to trees much yet, but we can. Essentially, the only generator of this is this laziness tree. Okay. Okay. Is there a lazy nest graph as well? Not yet. Because that's I'm the thing we need for find replace path, right? I don't think it, we actually need something like graph because what, what's the point of actually equivalencing some results it's just for it's like lazy nest tree but with some memorization or something because we saw that we don't do the same evaluation twice if you have the same inputs well okay i mean my question would be um when we were doing the stuff for the meta mathematics project and we were extracting proofs they're not just paths they're subgraphs well th those are much com a bit complicated more complicated because we there we have intermediate lemmas that we could right which are otherwise known as merged things in the graph i think uh, well it's not necessarily merged things in the multiway graph it's a completely different merged yeah, okay. thing. it's okay. just a thing that have more than one input in that case. Yes, where, where, which is something that again, we don't have in our, in our normal evaluation. I mean, this is another complicated story, which again, we've, we've discussed in previous meetings and we appear to have sort of lost that information. But anyway, you know, the, the, the point is that in that case, what we have is, you know, one way in which you have multiple inputs for an evaluation is by having something come from, uh, you know, the symbol table, x equals seven. You bring that in and you're evaluating x plus one, but meanwhile you have something, you know, from elsewhere coming into that uh, evaluation. You know, here we've just got two plus three goes to five, and that is a sort of a one input, one output evaluation. But in general, um, okay. In any case, so, I mean, all right. So, Leonid, do you want to talk about your approach to this and how it relates to all of this? Yeah, I can, although I have to say that uh, 
my approach has been pretty much very pragmatically oriented towards dealing with data. So um, there are definitely common common things. But one thing which I wanted to say right away is that I didn't tie anything of what I'm doing to the evaluation semantics uh, and using hold attributes and such. And uh, for me, it was, I think, very justified, but I also am kind of skeptical of closely tying this technology here to the evaluation semantics of the language simply because uh, it will be hard, evaluations are hard to control. Unwanted evaluations are hard to control. So I don't know, maybe in this case it's appropriate, but- Well, okay, but, but the thing that you were doing is, your thing is like a snake that eats, you know, a large animal and you gradually see the thing digesting mm -hmm. down the snake, so to speak, somehow. It's a, yeah. it's a thing where, where you've got a, a, a long piece of data. So for example, your source might be a file that mm -hmm. has, you know, a terabyte of data in it. Yeah. And you are now chunking that exactly. and you are applying functions to those chunks and then spooling the results back out to the file, for example, is that correct? Yeah, exactly. And uh, in fact, uh, okay, maybe I can, if, if you wish, I can share a screen for like yeah, please. five minutes and quickly go through. Yeah, go for uh, it. So, so basically, uh, um, so basically uh, it was explicitly about chunking because uh, because because of the data in mind, because of the efficiency in mind. And so you see there is this chunk level laziness, which means that uh, to me, uh, the operations are lazy on a chunk basis, but within each single chunk, operations are eager. So if you want to have an extreme case where this uh, kind of dissolves into pure laziness, you'll have to set the chunk size equal to one in my case. Uh, otherwise, you will have this kind of mix that uh, lazy things are for chunks and uh, within chunk, like let's say if you have a total, it will immediately total all the elements in the chunk without any laziness inside. Um, I had good reasons for doing it that way, uh, mainly for speed and memory uh, efficiency. But this at the same time makes this a somewhat more specialized thing in the sense that it's... Uh, it's probably less suited to the applications where you want element by element kind of like like the things you've been discussing with this tree traversals and so on. So I think uh, this is important to uh, this is important to keep in mind. Um, and then uh, I just I'll just remind there are some things which but I think show are... that example for primes because that's the example we be, we keep on using. So right, right, right. Uh, so this is how it works uh, in uh, uh, in this case here that uh, I define laser range, which is this lazy list uh, construct in yep. in my in streaming. Uh, if I am trying to sort it, it detects that it fails. It, yeah, okay, yeah, it fails. The same thing happens with primes. It detects that it doesn't know that it's finite, so it complains. But then, if you take first million primes, it's also uh, the, this one is also a lazy list, but it's now finite. And then, uh, well, this is something you've been complaining about for these ideas, but that's the kind of design issue. But the thing is, you can do a number of operations and some operations, like for instance, single part extraction is eager. It does it right away. If you do part with many elements, it will be lazy. Uh, and in general, there is a principle that whenever you do something that doesn't result in a lazy list, it will be done eagerly. Whenever you do something like select that does result in a lazy list, it will keep it lazy. And then uh, basically you can act like you can put, you can call normal on that uh, and that converts it back to uh, the normal list. And I was kind of comparing here that it, it, it does it pretty much the same speed in this case as in memory because of chunking, uh, but saving uh, a lot of memory, if, like memory efficiency is much, much better. Well, okay, so I want to just review what we, what you actually did here. So, mm -hmm. so the basic point is, in the most of the things you were looking at, there is an external source of data, correct? 
Uh, yes, except you can also think of uh, some internally generated data as, for instance, generated by a function of some sorts as a source. You can also define that. So let's say uh, you have some function which generates uh, next chunks of data, uh, whatever that can be, random or whatnot. That can also work. But in general, yes. Well, random is a complicated case because random... Yeah, you know, definitively goes on forever. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, but we, 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 I mean, streaming also supports infinite lists. So, uh, okay, but, can... but let's let's come back to what we can actually. I mean, you are defining something. You know, what we've been concentrating on is laziness for the sake of getting to multi-evaluate. Mm -hmm. Right. What you were concentrating on was laziness in, you know, the sense of being able to apply the operations chunk wise yeah so in that sense uh my case i think is different and somewhat more specialized but um so it's um it's i, I think it's a more yeah I, I think what i was doing was a, in some sense a more special case of what laziness can be in principle um, but the, but I also think that some principles that uh, I was applying here are general, like uh, how you uh, um, how you classify uh, which operations, uh, you know, like for instance, uh, division between eager and lazy operations, or decision which operations you has Nick seen any of this stuff? I'm not sure, but I've yeah. given a number of times all these presentations, and so. Including well, last can, time. Can Nick just answer this question? Has Nick oh, seen sorry, this? Sorry. Well, yeah, I've seen the, some of those presentations multiple times, yeah. OK. okay. Uh, so in any case, what I, what I was trying to say is that um, some of the, I think some of the conclusions are general, are valid for, for all, for, or maybe for most approach to laziness. And that is that we can probably compile an interface and we can probably classify things in terms of being eager and lazy, uh, but at least by default. Uh, and so, uh, so a lazy list could be an interface which has several implementations. So for instance, what I did could be an implementation most useful for data you know, wrangling and da data processing. While what Nick does might be useful or what Roman did might be useful for more for for things like what you are what you are after right now with multi computation because because I think what what I've done here it would have to be kind of pretty much bent against what it was intended to do to to really use be used in multi computation. But I, I know, but I'm trying to understand. We're trying to build one lazy list mechanism, right? Yeah. So if so, there is a use case for lazy lists that involves external data. We should understand what that is, and we should make sure that we can deal with it, right? So, can you yeah. describe? Okay. So yeah, I have a I have a slide here for the workflow. Okay. So what's the typical workflow envisioned for streaming? So first, you have to construct the streaming lazy list from external source, and that can also be done in different ways. You can either immediately convert if it's finite, for whatever reason. Uh, or you can have a delayed construction where, for instance, you are reading from a large file. And for instance, you don't want to read more than you need to do certain computation. So in that case, you have a cursor to that file. And uh, essentially, you read only as much as you need. Uh, if you do select, if it's you only need 100 things, you know, things like that. Uh, then you perform a chain of transformations, which are, in my terminology, non-terminal. Which means they're all they they all basically they leave leave back give back a lazy object. Yeah, yeah, and the single a single eager operation will prompt the entire chain to evaluate. So if it's uh, uh, anything that it's not a lazy list, like right, some but, but by the way, that's different from Nick's framework in which yes. you can get things partially evaluated and not the whole thing, right? Yes, is that correct? Nick? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, but that's cool. Uh, one thing I, you can do within streaming is that you can define nested. In principle, you can define nested uh, lazy lists, so lazy lists inside lazy lists. In that sense, you, you can nest laziness. But 
my experience was the kind of problems that were natural for streaming with data is that uh, you seldom need that and it's hard to control. But in your case, it might be actually different in, in the case for which Nick constructs his framework. So, um, okay, look, guys, guys, what a mess. I mean, we had the wrong people in this meeting and then we have, look, what we're trying to do here is we are trying to get one framework for dealing with lazy expressions and we're trying to, you know, our objective is to get this multi-computation stuff to work, right? For which we believe we have to get some kind of lazy, you know, construction. Now, what else do we think? You know, as a practical matter, you know, laziness for purposes of dealing with very large data sets, um, the, uh, um, uh, you know, I, mean, I think is, the, the, one of the things is just that you need to make assumptions about the, the shape of the data, you know, because yeah, if it's lazy, I mean, you need to have some interface for, for, for dealing with it, right? If it's lazy, because you can't get the whole object. Yes. And so, you know, I, I mean, I talked about this last time that I think that, that the idea of having kind of one interface for all kind of lazy list ideas, I think I'm skeptical of, if, you know, unless we have very careful naming, because I think that the, you know, there are these issues like, you know, certain issues, you know, mathematical arrays where you want one kind of, you know, lazy listing with a, with a particular kind of interface that's totally alien to the type of interface you'd like for, for example, reading a big file and streaming. Uh, Christopher, in fact, the first thing I started was uh, when, when I was asked today about my opinion was that I said that I agree with your Re, uh, with, with what you said last time, because I listened to the sure. live stream. Okay, yeah, good. good. And, yeah. and, and that, I mean, yeah, I was just saying, I totally agree with this. And I think what we really, uh, lazy list can be an answer to our, what to what we need, but it has to be an interface, not an, which which can have multiple implementations. And well, but we it's not about think... the implementations, I don't think. I think it's about the interfaces, right? Like yeah. if you have, for example, uh, you know, some generic kind of, lazy array in the tradition of structured array kind of things, mm -hmm. you know, that's something where you probably want to have like, oh, here's a generator function. You give it a position that gives you the value. If you want something that's, I'm reading from a file, you absolutely don't want a random access thing. It's probably not n-dimensional. It's probably one-dimensional. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a whole different, it's, it's not about having a different backend. It's about having a different interface. But I think these issues are mostly solvable if we give everything kind of modest, and specific names. Like if instead of calling it like, oh, this is the the lazy array or something, if we say something like, you know, oh, this is like a sub form of structured array that lets you have, you know, arbitrary, you know, generator functions for each element. Or, or for example, with the one dimensional thing, more similar to the streaming stuff or the lazy list stuff, I don't know, may, maybe if we had some more modest name for that, that made it clear that this is not, you know, this is for programmer use, not for mathematical use, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I guess the only, the, the, the big thing here is that uh, we should not uh, allow an interface which would have, which would, which will, which will require different semantics depending on different cases. So that should be a separate thing. So if we see that the semantics is really different in two cases, uh, then that probably shouldn't be a uh, shouldn't be the same interface. Yeah, but but listen, we're trying to actually move this to actually make something here. So I'm trying to understand. I mean, you know, the purpose of this meeting was to try to actually move forward the design of these objects. Unfortunately, we had the wrong people. We were very confused. But is there anything we can actually usefully achieve here, or should well, we? Well, what is the what is the real? I mean, I, I feel like. Most of these look there. There, there have been twenty-five different lazy list, infinite list, whatever things that people have made. But they mostly have. I mean, some of the internal details are different. But in terms of sort of the APIs they expose, they're all pretty similar. Which is a good reason to now say, let's figure out how to standardize that and build it into the language. Right, but I'm just. I, I think that that's not. I honestly think that that part is not a particularly hard problem. Again, because everyone's done basically the same thing. Uh, except, except Christopher, one thing which which I already sort of mentioned is that I think we should be uh, we should really decide whether like what what Nick is doing he is using hold all attributes as as a natural way 
like right. It's a cons and, list thing. Yeah, yes. but but what I uh, I'm rather skeptical of using of mixing together uh, for the general at least for the general purpose the uh, hold attributes and the laziness because mixing them together you will tie things very very closely to the evaluation semantics of the language in terms of normal you know the uh, I, I guess so I mean but but. I mean, I would argue, right. And there are also some, you know, there, there are performance implications about chunking and so on. And there's stuff about like, you know, dollar recursion limit, you know, but again, at some level, I would say, I mean, the, none of these, I think, affect much the top level design. They might affect, you know, if we're going forward with a particular implementation and it's a question of what implementation are we picking, then I guess that is an important question. But I, think, I, I would agree that again, I think they do. We, we've got two different drivers for this. And, and but Nick, uh, Leonard, if you can stop sharing, I'd sure. like to show one thing. Um, we've got two drivers for what we're doing here. One is the goal of dealing with multi evaluation. Okay, that's one driver. The other driver that I know of is the goal of dealing with large data sets or streams. Am I correct that those are the two drivers that we have for this at this time? I don't know whether it's just entertainment value of having a you know a demoable lazy thing. Well, my driver was mostly as a programming feature because I actually want to use lazy lists and lazy data structure as a programming. Okay, tool. for what kind of purpose? Because when I don't have to specify how many elements I want to take, I just want to deal with infinite list when I have no idea when I'm gonna stop. Or something, or generators in general. So, I mean, here would be an example of a, of a pure programming one that's maybe a little contrived, where, where you want something like this, which is if you're doing a kind of the project Euler style things of find me the first 10, you know, integer, you know, pairs of adjacent in integers where this is true, right? Right yeah. now, we don't really have a great way to do that. You can do some sort of while okay. loop where it's sowing and reaping stuff, or you can do you know, you run it for size up to 10,000. And if there aren't enough, you make, you know, you do it for size 100,000 or something like that. So, okay. Um, so this right. is finding things in an infinite structure, which That's is one some... pure programming example. Yes. But right. I have to say that for pure programming, uh, the top level or like, you know, the strategy based on uncompiled top level evaluation, I think is doomed just for the performance reasons. I mean, just, I, I don't. Not true. I, I mean, mean I, I've done, for example, with the Project Euler thing, for example, mm -hmm. like I've written that code both using some, you know, selective range and using uh, a while loop and so on. And performance is not a problem. Uh, well, okay. Uh, but no, it's just not going to be a problem in, the, in simple cases, right? In case where, look, this finding things in an infinite structure is similar to the sort of observer in uh, a multi-computation. That's the same, you know, that's the same type of thing. That's a, so that, that's a very theoretical way to put it. But I, mean, I think even more generally though, searching for things in an infinite list doesn't mean you have to search very far. It's just about the structure of the program. You might yeah. only have to search, you know, if, if I want to say, find me the first prime greater than a hundred, right? I mean, the point is that I don't need to look very far for, you know, it's going to be like the 25th prime or something like that. But, but I'm not going to, it's, it's it's nicer to write it like that than to write something where I say prime of range of a hundred and then find me the position, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, because you don't know how long, uh, you know, finding things in infinite structure, AKA, um, you know, a structure where you don't know how far you have to go. Yeah. But for that particular purpose, there is, there is also another way, another approach, and that is mutable iterators because they uh, very nicely, can very nicely be compiled. And so they are very memory efficient and very fast. I mean, just think of all the combinatorial generators. If you do your groupings of tuples, but then all you look do is look at each of them in turn, then there's no, no need to generate all of them in advance. Okay, so this is this is uh, incremental generation. Yeah, that's another one that I've. I, I want a lot. Subsets is the one that I've used the most. I guess it's very similar to tuples. But subsets, you can kind of hack it because I think it has a thing where you can ask for the nth yes. subset. Yes, it does. Um, but it's it's like, but you don't even, well, yeah, whatever. It's, it's, right, but so what's the general case of that, Roman? 
the general case of that concept. I mean, isn't that something where given a one-shot generator of subsets, you could imagine taking that code and making an incremental version of that. Yeah, Is I mean, you, you have you have like permutations or trees or anything, anything that typically uses a recursive algorithm to generate the whole set so that recursive algorithm can be turned into an incremental one in an iterative one. And so you have a single object with internal state and that is almost identical to our data types. So they, there's, a, there's already a very nice uh, compiler interface for that. And so that becomes uh, very, very efficient if you do it like that. Okay, so you're saying given a recursive definition, you can imagine, uh, given a recursive generator, basically, yes. you can, there is a transformation, there is a way of, of and I think this can be probably related to the whole question about evaluation orders. Given a recursive generator, there is a way of doing some kind of, I don't know whether it's depth first or something else, question mark, question mark, traversal, that gives the thing in that gives you know successive uh things that would be generated yeah right. there's actually it's, it's probably similar to i mean i'm not sure how we would implement something like this but but several languages like python has this concept of yield so basically what you do is you write you know, your generator function like your next function in your in your iterator and instead of writing a return statement you write a yield statement and so basically what it will do is that, you know, if you call next, it'll run it until it hits a yield and then it will, you know, yield whatever you ask it to yield. But then you when you ask the for state. next again, yes. it'll mm. continue from that spot and keep going. So you can have like a for loop where you say, you know, you know, for I in a billion yield I, and then it well, will, you know, as you call so? next. Why isn't that the same as so? Well, because it has to stop when it hits the yield, return it out to this outer area. And then it has to sort of keep track of the state of the stack and only, you know, rehydrate that if you ask for next again. I actually I mean, implemented lazy tree traverses in JavaScript using nested generators, so I can I can confirm that 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 really works pretty nicely. You can kind of freeze the traversal state of a tree at any given point. Okay, so this is a concept of yield. You know, yield and next. Yeah, I mean, we should find out whether our compiler can support that. That would be really, really great. Christopher? Yeah, I, I'd have to think about it. But I mean, I, I can imagine that might be doable. I mean, with some sort of closure thing or something. But I mean, the, the other thing yeah. is, I mean, th this is the general way of just turning a, a recursion into an iteration by just keeping track, track of the stack. But I mean, the whole the whole of chap of volume four of Knuth, the art of computer programming, is about clever incremental algorithms for uh, combinatorial generators, like a efficient way to find the next tree, next permutation, next whatever. And so there's a lots of lots of literature about that. And we could even think of a, a library of compiled iterators for our combinatorial generators. Well, but okay, but, but the basic point is something like subsets already has a serial number that you can request in it. But it would be great if you get some, you know, yeah, some subsets may not be that, that you can map over. I mean, it, it may, it right, may be you. expensive to compute, but if yeah, you, like the if you know that you have, yeah. you, you, you need them in order, then you, you might as well just keep the state around and not start from scratch every time. Right. And also just from a programming perspective, it's much nicer to say, get me all the subsets of length, you know, three to 10 map over this object. I don't know what it, what it is. You know, you have some functions, you know, lazy subsets, that's a bad name, but you know, and then you map over it as opposed to having to know, oh, well, you know, there are, you know, three choose n, you know, subsets of length three and then plus right. four but choose n subsets is... of length n and you know, it's just a mess. somehow this reminds me of root sum, which gives you, you know, for a given function, right? It gives you the sum of the roots, sum of this function applied to, uh, you know, applied to the roots of something. Right? Is, am I? I mean, does this make? Is that a, what? Does that not? What is, how does root sum work? I thought root sum had a polynomial. 
Oh, I see. What? One over X squared. Oh, no, no, no. It's the other way around. There we go. So this is that same kind of concept in, in some sense. I mean, you could imagine a subset scan, which just takes F and scans it over all those subsets. I'm not sure that's the, but that, that's the rough thing you're right. talking about. Yes. But, but, but the idea is instead of having one flow, which could be useful on its own, is to have, you know, a, a scan function where, you know, you, it'll, it'll apply to all of them and, and so on. The other flow, which I think we're talking about here as a novel flow that we don't do right now, is you call, you know, magic subset, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, you know, and it returns a magic subset object that represents, you know, conceptually, this magic subset object is just the list of all the subsets, but it doesn't actually compute them. And then you can map over this object or you can do whatever you want over this object right. and it'll kind of oh. behave like that list. But, this but that's already... essentially lazy subsets, isn't it? Yes, exactly. I mean, that's exactly uh, lazy subsets. Let, let me mention that people on Stack Exchange already used streaming and implemented kind of plugins for lazy tuples and subsets with pretty amazing results in terms of memory and speed. And uh, these are pretty high voted uh, Stack Exchange uh, uh, discussions. Or they, they yeah, but, but Leonid, yeah. Leonid, Leonid. The stuff you worked on, how long ago is it? Like five years ago now or something, right? You know, yes. we never managed to figure out how to plug this in to the main sort of design of the system. This is, you know, this is an opportunity to do that. Exactly. So let's, let's figure out how to do it, right? I agree. Because you've already built a bunch of, I mean, what you've specialized in is this out of core chunked operations. And which is completely different from what Nick is talking about right now. And, you know, I think, and that's yet different again, because the things this yield next type mechanism is again, a very much, you know, there's no out of core stuff. It's the, the what well, well, actually, I mean, the yield next is more a way of specifying an iterator than actually, you know, how the iterators but, are internally represented. Stephen, yes. but also in my, uh, in streaming there, it's not necessarily out of core. Like when we consider it infinite primes or similar examples. Uh, they're not yes, but, but your chunking is a thing that has to do with, you know, that's an out of core play. No, not necessarily. No, no, chunking is not. Chunking is partly just to take advantage of vectorization in a lot of cases. Exactly, exactly. Okay. I, I experimented this too. I was playing around with, you know, some some console stuff a, a while ago. I mean, there was, there was, right, there's there's cases, especially with stuff like select and so on, where where if you... For example, if you do select just, just doing, you know, tests sort of one at a time, like the most efficient thing is to do selects on chunks of size, like 50 or something like that for you know the tests I did, whatever. I mean, okay. The, All right. How yeah. do we start to bring, okay, this is interesting again, this yield next type thing where, I mean, it's a little funky and I mean, how would we do this? Um, I, yeah, I think that requires more thought. And I think that's honestly a, a separate issue. It's an issue that, you know, it's pretty much any of these systems, if we have a way of representing an infinite list, streaming list, lazy, whatever, you know, whatever this object you want to call it, then, then you know, the work of, of, of supporting something like a yield next interface is probably possible, but probably non-trivial. Right. But I mean, design-wise, there will be like a yield accumulator that wraps some expression which contains yeah but well, still before before yeah. you go further with the yield i have to say that yield is uh is is a characteristic for procedural programming no i understand so we're trying to figure out what the functional analog of it is right because normally it's the alternative to return i mean it's a little bit though like a throw well yes it is well, or, it, like, I mean, or like it ties a to the idea of a continuation in, in functional programming, right? because that's yeah, actually how you would implement it by just getting hold of the current state of the computation, stashing it away somewhere, and at any later time, uh, put it put it back and continue. 
Yeah, which yeah, we don't have a great arrow. mechanism to do that. And we don't have a recursive evaluator, right? I mean, we cannot, I mean, right. we would need the function, uh, an eval the evaluator as a function, then you could call the evaluator and whenever there's a yield, that process would stop, return a result and remain intact until you tell it to continue. Right. Dan on our live stream is mentioning yield might be like dialogue plus stack. Yes, except that we don't store enough information on the stack to be able to do what Roman is saying. Right. Um, but, okay. Well, I mean, okay. So, so coming back again to this question about, you know, the lazy constructs and their... Uh, so I take this point about incremental generation of things. I don't really know what to do with that because all of the, I mean, you know, one could implement all those things in a, you know, in a Knuth harvesting kind of way. One could just go ahead and implement all of those different sort of incremental algorithms for all these things. Yeah, I think it would be worth having. I mean, Right. We talked the other day about constructors for lazy, infinite, whatever lists. And we talked about stuff like there has to be an infinite range, infinite nest. I think that also probably would make sense to have, you know, infinite subsets, infinite, you know, not infinite subsets, but you know what I mean. Um, well, but it isn't infinite subsets. It's, it's, it's you have a specific list of things and you're being asked, you know, let, let's say I had done, you know, subsets, which I'm not going to do, but let's say I had did subsets. And, and I said, you know, range of 100 or something. That would be, you sure. know, that's two to the 100 things. So, right. And so I think that you probably, I mean, there are two, two things we could ask people to do. One thing we could ask people to do is to do some kind of, um, you know, or, well, right. I mean, we can, we can, I think the right thing would probably be to have a special lazy subsets function that just returns a different kind of object. I mean, just as we might have, a, you know, I mean, I guess we don't really do this, but just as we might have a function where there's a version that returns a sparse array and a version that, that returns a normal list. Uh, an alternative no, would be to have a headdress. Yes, I agree. But I mean, but but that's... I mean, but another alternative, if, if there isn't, if there isn't, uh, if the algorithm isn't particularly, isn't much, if the sort of knuthization of it isn't important, if basically just using the indexing subsets is, is already pretty efficient, then we can also just do something where you, you map over uh, a lazy range and the mapping function is just calling subsets on a particular index or whatever, but yeah. I don't think, I mean, I'm just trying to think this, this case, this seems, I mean, the, the reason sparse array works is because sparse array has the feature that sparse goes to sparse, right? You know, mm -hmm. in other words, if you give it sparse array as input, um, there are functions and they're a bit inconvenient that return sparse arrays spontaneously, so to speak. See what I'm saying? Yes. And right, but I mean, this, is, this is the same business. I mean, where where operations on on lazy lists will return, you know return another lazy list. I think the thing with sparse arrays that's more of a problem is that there are functions like, um, I, in fact, actually, I don't think this is a problem with this function, but it might be, which is like adjacency matrix, where maybe for a small one, it returns a normal list. For a big one, it returns a sparse yeah, array. because it expects dense graphs, so it doesn't really care. But there are other things like that where it returns, you know, where by default it returns a sparse array. But adjacency matrix, I think, always returns a sparse array. Does it? I think so. It certainly sometimes does. What one of the examples I know about because there was some bug report about this or a suggestion report was um, uh, uh, identity matrix because identity matrix has some obscure and maybe undocumented uh, that, that oh one, sparse whatever version you're typing. Well, yeah. If you just put the second argument, if you just write sparse array, oh, it'll return a sparse array. Yeah, no, I understand. But there was the yeah. issue of if you write identity matrix of five hundred whether it should auto sparsify because basically generating the actual thing is utterly hopeless. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It generates a sparse array. 
Wow. But try a tiny, try a tiny graph. Instead of 30, say, you know, yeah. Yeah, okay. It always does a sparse array. So that's a spontaneous sparseness thing. And arguably, subsets of range of 100, if it spontaneously produced a lazy subsets, that would be a lot more useful than just running out of memory. Well, but I, I don't know. I, I, I'm kind of think that's scary. The, the yeah, idea of I, returning a different thing like that. No, I agree with you. I don't think it's great. But so Leonid's point of a headdress would be that is the signal to always return something. That is, I mean, you know, just like identity matrix. Okay. And now you're saying, is there a sparse? I think it's just sparse array. Yeah. Okay. I'm not even sure that's documented. I didn't know that. It's very use useful, it though. I use it all the time, the quantum framework. Yeah. Oh, no, it is. It is. It's sort of documented. <laughs> right. Okay, but that's a great example of where... Uh, yeah, I mean, that that's exactly the kind of thing where one could say subsets could take an argument that says, you know, it could do the same thing. It's not a very elegant design. It could do the same thing where it has an argument that says return a lazy object. Well, you know, but then I mean, the problem is with subsets is that, you know, subsets, there, there are functions like subsets or like maybe partitions or things like that that might take, you know, five arguments or something and so yeah no i know it's a, six hopeless. Star it's a hopeless mess it's a hopeless mess no it's not the right I way mean, to do it there are, there are more elegant ways to do it i mean one thing i've i've done for the iterators is uh, or let's go back to the the lazy list example because that that's uh, closer to what we're talking about so we, we have this lazy range function and we have a lazy version of all the constructors that we can think of constant array range nest list and so on but we could just have a wrapper like lazy. You could say lazy of range, lazy yeah. of nest list, and so on. And that would know which ones it can handle and produce lazy lists and an error otherwise. Yeah, that's essentially what, what I think Leonid was suggesting. Mm -hmm. It's the head yeah. idea. Yeah. Okay. Right. My, my way, only concern would be how we how we show, I mean, maybe we can use some sort of magic autocomplete stuff, but how we show people what lazy operations are available. I think autocomplete is the right way to do that. By and the also, way, this is a... We, we could, uh, Stephen, we could also, if we decide to do the headdress, we could also have the uh, page uh, for the headdress symbol where we can list all the symbols for which... Sure, sure. Exists. Yeah, no, no, I agree. I mean, but this is another... It's just very difficult with all these different things about compilation and sparseness and this and that and the other, what's supported and what's not. Right. By the way, oh, I just oh, although actually, sorry, one quick final point though. What about the issue of um, of when functions have different usages in their lazy case? So, for example, nest list where it doesn't need a third argument, or do we just require that someone writes infinity in that case? I mean, there might be other cases that were really meaningless to have a you know some argument. Yeah, I think we well, we discussed that before. We shouldn't switch around right i mean as we do here i mean sometimes now i mean here you could argue that as is with the case of normal lists and with packed arrays uh you don't need to know which one it chooses but if we do lazy computation we really need to know whether we can accept the lazy result or not right i don't think it's too horrifying to have to say infinity here but you know, that's a no, sorry. Here you don't need it because the lazy stuff knows that. Well, I know that, but the, right, but the question is can you have a need, different usage? The need, can, the, can a, yes, I mean, if we have different usages for lazy of nest list than for nest list, then it just affects how we have to document things. Because, yeah, we might as well you know, just have a lazy nest list function in that case. Hmm. Well, right, the other because it needs to have is, a usage line documented somewhere. Yeah, but the other option is that you add this usage line for each function for which there is this lazy interface. I know, but 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 it's not obvious then. If the signature of the function is different in the lazy case, why not just have a lazy nestless function? Wait, so Leonid, is that I mean that's an interesting idea though, which I don't think we do anywhere, which is that you'd have a usage line 
where instead of it saying nest list of blah, 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 you know, explaining it, it would say lazy of nest list of blah, yes. blah, blah, yeah, right yeah. under the usage lines of nest list. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. We have and, tried to do that a few cases, but it is a mechanism we could consider. Yeah. And the reason is that you don't then introduce new symbols with essentially similar semantics. You could have to, to expand the existing documentation for those for lazy cases. Yeah. The only problem is if, they, if it ends up that we have corner cases where the semantics are different. Well, in that case, this can go also to, you know, certain sections in the documentation in the same for the same function. I would hope there was a principle that, that we could avoid stuff like that, though, because I think right. that the semantics of these lazy, lazy lists or whatever they're called, I think, you know, like with the idea with, you know, associations are lists with named indices, you know, these should just be lists, like they should avoid at all costs any behavior that's different from what lists do. Yeah, um, I unfortunately this meeting was not well organized, and I unfortunately really have to go. So, um, uh, at least my part of this needs to wrap up, and I think we need to, we should continue this with all the relevant active participants here. Um, and unfortunately, we we um, we goofed a bit. Uh, maybe next week we'll we'll be we could pick this up again, um, and next time could we please try to enumerate. Uh, you know the things we're talking about here. We've we've surfaced in the last like uh, you know ten minutes of this meeting. We've surfaced a lot of the real issues here, and at the beginning we we seem to just recirculate again on some of the things we've already talked about. I, I do want to just mention one thing, which is something that Nick has implemented here, which people saw earlier in this meeting, which is this clickable, you know, uh, go another level which to me is, a, I really had never thought about this before, but it's kind of like a functional programming version of a debugger, of an of a, of a interactive debugger. I mean, it's also like elision of, a, of, you know, it's like code folding, but where it's dynamic. Okay, any last comments from anybody before we wrap up for today? Nope. Okay, well, thanks everybody. Next time... We'll have the right set of people from the beginning and a better agenda, and we will have a better meeting. Um, but thanks. See you all soon.